Welcome back, everybody. It's good to see you all again, virtually. So, all right. So, first off, just to clarify the, um, the project proposals, these are coming up next week. And I've been getting questions about this, and I, I figured we should make sure to address all of these questions before, before next week. So, the plan for Tuesday is to have you each present live in class your research project proposals. And uh, we, um, I don't know, we're about 10 or so. I, I don't know exactly how many we are uh, still in the class. So I think about five minutes each would be a good amount of time. Uh, so not more than that for the presentation itself so that we have a little bit of time to you know, give each other some feedback and discuss some uh, ideas around, around your plans. That makes sense? So the ask is that you prepare a five minute presentation or shorter, that's fine, of course, shorter is fine, um, with your project proposal. Um, and this should contain the research questions or question, you know, it could be multiple questions, the motivation for the research questions, like why is it that these questions are worth answering? What's the knowledge gap? And what's the hook? What's the benefit from answering these questions? You know, remember we, the lecture on um, formulating research questions and lit review? It's like all of those things that we discussed in the past. Right? Um, I, I want to see that you sort of thought about why the questions are important and, and why they're worth answering and what's the benefit from, from answering them. Um, and then a rough um, an, an overview of the study you're hoping to conduct. And so, for example, um, it could be that you're not planning an exclusively empirical study. That's perfectly fine. Um, what I'd like, though, to see is that there's some empirical component in, in your plan, in your project. Like, you know, it could be that the main contribution is some new tool or something. And then, you know, the empirical component could be the evaluation. Or it could be that the main contribution is, I don't know, simulation or something else. Uh, that's all fine. Um, but then you know there has to be some empirical component so that so that you can apply some of the things we're learning in class. So by overview of the study design, I just mean like, uh, you know like which methods are you planning on using? How do the questions that you're planning on asking relate to the methods you're planning on using to address them? You know which methods are you going to use to answer which question? Um, if if your uh, questions or answering them involves collecting data or things like this, you know, like where do you plan to get your data from and, and so on. So just a, a little bit of, a um, li little bit of detail, but so high level stuff uh, on how you're planning on doing this. Um, and that's what I meant there by overview of study design is sort of how the, the different methods fit together and how do they help address the questions you're asking. And rough plan for data collection and analysis, I mean, sort of, you know, like how many participants are you hoping to recruit and how do you hope to be able to recruit them and what kinds of variables you know it's okay if you haven't thought about all the details of course but at this point you know, what kinds of variables are you hoping to collect and so on so for example if you remember the student example of the nl to code tool that would take a natural language and would generate code um, there uh, um, a rough plan for data collection and analysis would be to say that um, we are going to de design some tasks and we're going to recruit some programmers to complete those tasks in a controlled environment. And we're going to measure how fast people finish their tasks and how correctly uh, they finish their tasks, for example. You know, it's OK if you haven't thought about exactly how to measure that and what that means. But, but just having thought a little bit about the high level constructs, concepts that you're hoping to uh, measure. OK, so that's, that's the ask for the project proposal. So pause for questions. Nope, never mind. That's fine. <laughs> Okay, if you think of anything by the end of class or outside class, you know, just find me and ask me. That's the, that's the proposal. And for the final report, since we're talking about this, um, 
I would like to see a write-up uh, with all of these things flushed out in sort of sufficient amount of detail. I'm calling this publishable level, uh, publishable quality, so a publishable level of detail, right? So, you know, it's okay if you don't finish the project by the end of the semester. Uh, I mentioned that from the beginning, but I'd like to see that you have put um, a lot of thought into those, the setup for your for your studies. Uh, and, you know, I, I want to see like, a, you know, a flushed out literature review and, uh, you know, more worked out description of methods and data and, and things like this. By the end, you will have been exposed to uh, the entire range of analyses, qualitative and quantitative that we're, we'll be covering in class. So, you know, I want to see more uh, description of how you're going to use those if you haven't used them already by then and, and so on. So just more detail uh, of on, on how you're going to do all of this. Similar to what you would do in a research proposal, for example, for, I don't know, the National Science Foundation PhD fellowship or a research proposal for the Google, Microsoft, Facebook PhD fellowship or what have you. Uh, and, and similar to what we as faculty would put in a research proposal for you know, any funding agency. Uh, so everything but results essentially, but that means like, a, you know, worked out literature review and clearly identified knowledge gap and contributions and so on and plan for um, things that will happen during the project and, and whatnot and, 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 you know, sufficient level of detail. I'm calling this of publishable quality. Um, I um, hope that you will get to use the stuff that you write for class as part of papers that you were working on anyway and will end up publishing. So that's why I'm calling this of publishable quality. Of course, it's not a requirement that you publish this for the class. Yeah, I hope that's clear. All right, so I wanna go back to, to um, our topic from last time. Uh, there were a few more interesting things I wanted to, uh, to share with you. I was reading about um, these intricacies of designing surveys and questionnaires and formulating questions and some of the biases that creep up with surveys. Um, and I've learned a lot by reading some of the stuff over the past week. And I wanted to share more of this stuff with you. You've seen some of this already on, uh, on Tuesday and I'm hoping to you know, finish the discussion of those today. Okay, so uh, let's see, do just for uh, to remind ourselves, I, I believe we talked about four types of errors that can occur when designing surveys or survey instruments or conducting surveys. Does anybody remember what some of the four or all of the four were? Um, I think there was a sampling error. That's one, yeah, that's, yes. Well, do, what was that about, do you remember? I think it, it was about uh, where, your, um, where your samples are from. Uh, so to basically make sure where you choose your uh, samples, uh, the that population are going to be the same as uh, your basically the target of your study. Cl close, but not quite. Th that was that was another one of these errors, though. So oh, okay. you, you've gotten the error right, <laughs> gotten the explanation for the error right, but they're not for the same. <laughs> they're not. <laughs> Uh, corresponding to each other. Is the sampling error the one where uh, whatever you sample is not representative of your entire population? That's the one, yes. So the sampling error occurs because you're obviously only able to survey some sample of your target population. You can't survey everyone. It's just infeasible. And the possible errors would occur if the people you end up surveying are very different from the people you could have surveyed if you had more resources to survey more people. So it's about how representative your sample is relative to the population you're sampling from. Uh, and the idea was that the larger the sample, the more representative it is, a random sample. If you're, if you're drawing random samples from a population, the larger the sample, the more representative it is. But we had all of these surprising um, things last week, uh, lecture, I thought they were surprising at least, um, showing how few people relatively you would need to survey to uh, still have a sort of high confidence uh, 
sample of, of a very large population like the population of the United States. Remember that? It, all it took was about 2,000 people to have a, a high quality random sample of the 328 million people in the US. So, th so that was sampling error. The other one, Sam, that you mentioned was about coverage error. That's the one where um, if the population you're sampling from is not the entire population of interest, right? You risk um, not capturing all of the things that uh, that might apply to the whole population, uh, the population as a whole. So I gave this example of how if I am sampling open source developers from the GitHub platform, I'm missing out potentially on lots of open source developers that are not using the GitHub platform, that are using other platforms or, or no platforms or what have you. And it's possible that those people are very different, right? So whatever I'm learning by studying open source developers on the GitHub platform, for example, may not generalize to all open source developers if those ones that I uh, don't have an opportunity to sample and, and study are very different. That was coverage error. Um, what else did we have? Measurement error. So, measurement error. Measurement error. What was that? Uh, it's whether the metrics you use represents the, the, the true value of the thing you want to measure. Mm -hmm. Right. So how how much can you trust the things you're actually measuring? Okay, so we'll see good examples of that in a minute. And something else still, a fourth one. It's a non-response error. That's it. Mm -hmm. What was that? Um, it's um, not everyone you want to sample will respond to your survey. Right. I guess. But what, yeah. why is that a problem? Um, or, or potentially a problem. You know, maybe it's not. But why? Why could it be? Um, because the people who respond can be very different from the people who doesn't respond. That's right, that's right, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. exactly. So, you know, again, you're kind of capturing a biased view um, here because it could be that the people who respond are very different from the people that you, that, that did not respond, but you still invited, right? Um, it could be that the people who respond um, care very deeply about the topic you're, you know, asking them about. So they self-select into responding, right? They're eager to participate in the study because they sort of care a lot about the, the topic. But you've seen that you know, response rates tend to be pretty low, right, for surveys. So you know, let's say you end up with a 10% response rate on some survey. That's the case. It could be that you know, you're only capturing the views of these 10% very eager people and you're missing out on the other 90% that are maybe very different, right? So we just, we don't know, right? That was non responsive Okay, so um, let's see. We talked, oh yeah, we talked about some of these biases that were, uh, that were super interesting. Does anybody remember what this was about, social desirability? Is this the one where, uh say filling out a survey on paper you might respond differently than uh responding directly to an interviewer's face for example based yeah. on perceptions of what is reasonable socially yeah so that that's one instance where this could occur um the bias itself is not about answering on paper versus answering live but um it's more about um how, how, when um, questioned in general, and especially when questioned directly by another human, you're less likely to admit to socially undesirable behavior, just because by admitting to that behavior, it might paint you in a negative light. And we had examples of, I don't know, driving under influence and things like that um, before, right? So, you know, be because the behavior that you're being questioned about is considered socially undesirable, perhaps, th uh, perhaps then uh, you're less likely to admit to engaging in this behavior, right? Because it's sort of, you know, admitting guilt to some extent. Um, so that was one, we talked about this. Uh, I'm not gonna go over these again, I'm just skipping. If I can 
click enough times. There was this other one that was interesting. Do you remember acquiescence? Kyle is nodding. Yeah, I agree. Pun <laughs> <laughs> intended. Yeah, it's a tendency for um, your, uh, um, I guess your interviewees that they'll just agree to the statement that you propose or mm -hmm. that you give them. Right. So people like to be, tend to be agreeable. So uh, they're more likely to agree to, to whatever you ask them. Uh, so this is, this is acquiescence bias. Okay, so we talked about that too. Um, and we had some examples. Uh, Kyle has some good points about um, margin of error. Uh, I haven't looked at the original paper still, so I don't have any more information on that. Uh, do let me know if you end up reading them, I'm curious. Okay, so I think this is sort of where we left off. Um, primacy, and, so let's talk about this for a second, primacy and recency. Um, let me take one example here. So this, this model distinguishes between self-administered surveys and interviewer administered surveys. So we talked about this a little bit before when we talked about social desirability. Is it is it there a human asking you these questions live? That would be the interviewer administered version versus do you just do this on your own, um, you know, in, in the privacy of your home or whatever. Um, so things could be different depending on kind of the mode the survey is administered through. So let's let's take one for example. Let's take the self-administered one. So you're you're filling this out on your own at home. Okay, that's the top row here, um, and you're reading um, possible answers to you know one of these survey questions, right? And you have to I don't know agree or disagree with them, right? That's sort of a common type of survey question. And so here the idea is that um, as you're reading these possible answers and you know, deciding what to fill in. Um, if the earlier answers, answer options you read, if you find those plausible, turns out you're more likely to select those. This is called primacy. You've been primed by the things you've seen and you're, more, you're biased towards that, okay? If instead, you, you know, as you're reading the answer options, you find the things you have read um, earlier implausible, you're more likely to just discard them and um, more likely to answer, to, to select the options that come later. Okay, so this is called recency. You're sort of biased towards things you've read recent, recently. Um, and the, so the model here talks about how the situation is reversed when there's a human interviewer asking these questions. Um, and the idea there is that, um, you know, say, say I, I'm the interviewer and I'm asking you all these questions. Um, and uh, I don't know, there's like lots of, I'm giving you lots of answer options. And it's a long set of things that I'm asking you to choose from, okay? Uh, just because there's so many things that you don't have written in front of you, right? You don't have the leisure of reading these on your on your own time, but I'm sort of asking these verbally, um, you're more likely to forget the things I've mentioned at the beginning of my question and to remember the things that I've just mentioned at the end of my question. Okay. So you see these things being flipped here. So if the late, the, the later items, the last things I mentioned as options, as answer options, when I'm asking you this question, if those seem plausible, you're much more likely to select those. Just because, just because they're fresher in your mind and you've forgotten the things I've asked you earlier or the answer options I've given you earlier uh, and, and, and so on and vice versa. So this is sort of a well-known uh, model of how recency and primacy um, play out in, in any kind of um, surveys or, or interviews. There's, I looked into this a little bit based on what the book uh, talks about, and uh, there seems to be mixed empirical evidence for this. So I, I'm not 100% sure on like which of these things are bulletproof, well supported by empirical evidence, and, and which are uh, which are not. So I'm not going to talk more about this, but so keep that in mind. And I will show you some um, concrete examples of, sort of related things in a minute. So here's a, another cool thing: uh, anchoring. You probably 
if you've ever watched these um, TV shows where people have to like bid on items or whatnot, like Price is Right type things, that's sort of a classic example where that happens. Um, anchoring has to do um, with um, an early response option uh, forming, creating the standard of comparison against which you, um, you compare all later response options. So here's a study sort of showing how this plays out. In Germany, a uh, long time ago, they asked people which food is more typically German. Okay? And they gave them, uh, so this was a randomized trial. They split people into, uh, into groups randomly. And they gave them the same options, but in different order. Okay? The, the one group, they gave the options potatoes and rice in this order. The other group, the options were the same, but the order was switched. Okay? So in the potatoes followed by rice group, 30% of respondents chose potatoes are more typically German. Okay. In the rice followed by potatoes group, 48% of respondents said potatoes are more typically German. Okay. And they're attributing this to anchoring, to the fact that um, in, the, in the second case, when people that thought formed their uh, opinion about potatoes, they had already thought about rice and had sort of calculated this, uh, made this comparison uh, in their heads. Whereas with the other one, that was not the case, right? So in the second case, potatoes was anchored in, in rice and um, therefore uh, appeared uh, more uh, typically German when compared to rice because of the order in which the answers were given. This is one of the seminal papers in this area of um, like question answer orders, uh, answer option orders. Why, those... well, why is it anchoring instead of primacy that we discussed before? I, I, think, it, I think they're very related. I think um, anchoring and primacy are very related here. Um, I, I don't, I think anchoring is maybe a kind of primacy or there's some sort of relationship between these. Uh, they're, not, they're not independent concepts. Yeah, I, I agree. This, this feels just like what we talked about a, a minute ago. I have a, another example from one of our other classes that might um, show the difference a little better. Um, we have been talking about like expert elicitation and how if you start with, uh, you know, I don't know how far away from your house is CMU and they say five miles and then you say okay well how far away from your house is Ohio then what they're basing that off of is five miles and it's you know I don't know 100 times more than five miles it's only right so instead of like starting at the, the lowest end and the highest end you get different answers if you start in the middle versus the outside right Thank you, that was a great example. Uh, you reminded me of yet another one uh, that I, I forgot to include here. That one was about asking um, people to estimate how long it would take to develop some software system to, to implement some piece of software. And the, um, the way the question was asked was the following. In one group, they said, um, we have no idea how long this might take. Could you, could you tell us how long this might take? That was one. Second group was, um, we believe this should take about two weeks, but how long do you think this should take? And the, the third one was, we believe this should take about two months. How long do you think this should take? Okay, and, and there you also saw exactly this, uh, this anchoring effect that um, the, um, the low ball estimate, sorry, the, the low anchor um, caused people to give a low ball estimate and the high anchor caused people to give a, a high ball estimate. So same idea, just like with estimating distances. Yeah. So there are lots of studies, maybe better than the one with potatoes. So I should have included better examples. Thank you for, for the comment. It's it's the study just to describe a good example of anchoring instead of, for example, if I'm not actually very sure about how much time it's going to cost. But since you give me 
some of your opinions. I may take that into consideration when I give you my answers. So it may not be an anchoring effect. It's just I consider others' opinions and give you the answer because I don't know the actual answer. Mm. As I understand this, the term anchoring means literally that. Okay, it means um, so an anchor is like a hook, right, for boats. It means you're you're like being drawn by this additional piece of information that is being provided. It doesn't matter where it's coming from, um, but you're, so you're being drawn towards it, just like a you know like an, a rope would, an, an anchored rope would pull you towards the wherever the anchor is fixed. So I, I think that's literally what this means, but I that's just my understanding of this. I see. Uh, I, I guess just another case I, I saw from um, the book Thinking Fast and Slow, um, like in the business world, like like in terms of negotiation, if you want to sell your, start, sell your startup, startup, if you start with a higher price, you're more likely to get a higher than expected price instead of starting with a lower offer. I guess I think that's another anchoring effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the same effect that occurs with these game shows on TV that have to do with, with like money and, and things. Okay. So this was about some of these biases. Um, we're going to see actually a few more examples in a minute of, of other things that can go wrong. But let's dive a little bit deeper into specifics of questions so I could show you those examples. So um, here are some common types of survey questions. Uh, I'm sure you will have seen uh, these or, or similar ones. Um, you could have, for example, fully open-ended questions. This is much like what you would ask in an interview. It's an open-ended question. Here, the example is, what is the most important problem facing Nebraska today in, in this example I'm showing you? Okay. And, uh, you, participants just sort of uh, tell you whatever they feel like telling you. Um, you could have sort of specific questions that um, ask for specific values or numbers of things, a number of years a person has lived in, in that particular state. Um, these are, both of these are open-ended, right? You're, people aren't selecting one of the a predefined answer from a from a set or a list. They're entering the answer themselves, and that's since they're open ended. Or you could have closed ended questions. So, um, for example, how satisfied are you with living in in Pittsburgh? Um, and you have these very common uh, scales that you've seen, I'm sure, uh, many times over by now in other places, from completely satisfied to completely dissatisfied, and like with different answer options in between. Um, or you could have so select uh, kind of multiple multiple choice style questions. Select one of many possible answers, um, or you could have partially closed ended questions. So that's the example you see here, where um, you're given some options to choose from. You can select multiple options. So those aren't radio buttons; they're check boxes. You see that, and if none of those is to your liking, you still have the option of entering something yourself in the in the bottom free text. Uh, bar. Okay, these are just some common types of um, questions that you could ask in a survey. So you might ask, why does any of this matter? Like, does it matter how you ask questions? Yes, matters a lot how you ask questions. So let's look at some examples. Um, okay, so here the um, the first example um, illustrates how the question was vague as originally formulated. So the question was. How many times did you eat together as a family last week? Um, the researchers here were, were looking for, um, they're studying sort of um, eating habits of, of families. Okay, so the question was, how many times did you eat together as a family last week? Okay, so why, why am I saying this is ambiguous? Uh, sometimes I eat out with my family, for example. Uh -huh. that I mean, not recently, but. <laughs> right so like you know should you count those in and like what does eating mean like if i'm if we're having snacks if we're having ice cream does that count as eating or like you 
you know, if we're having dinner, probably, but like if we're having snacks, does it still count? Does breakfast count? You know, what counts, what doesn't count, right? So you can see how this can be interpreted in, in different ways, right? You know, does eating out count? Does eating snacks count and so on, right? So that's, that's a poorly formulated question. So can we do better? Yes. So here's uh, so the middle answer is an, an improvement, sorry, the middle version uh, is an improvement on that. Um, instead, they could have asked, how many meals did you eat together as a family at home last week, right? So this would address the problem that Jeremy raised with you know, eating out, right? So that's clearly not in scope here. So you shouldn't count those. Better still, you could ask, how many meals did you sit down to eat at home as a family last week, okay? So, you know, maybe if you're having snacks, maybe you're not sitting down for, for dinner, um, sitting down in the same way that you might for dinner, okay? So this would tell you that you shouldn't count those in, okay? So again, um, this is something that comes up in surveys, something that comes up in interviews, a lot in interviews, right? So how you formulate your questions, by the way, also comes up in how you ask research questions. We've had an entire lecture on, on formulating research questions and an entire discussion of how um, vague questions can be made more specific. So this is just sort of more of the same idea. Um, vagueness should be eliminated from, from instruments uh, to the extent possible. Um, right, the, the last bullet there is about using previously validated scales um, where possible. So like if, if there's a survey instrument or a set of questions that somebody has developed and validated before that is capturing the same concepts you're trying to capture, then you're much better off using that thing than so developing your own because people have put a lot of thought into validating that particular instrument. Um, we'll talk more later today. I, I have specifics of, about what it means to validate an instrument. So let's table that for now. But remember this, like remember that if the concept you're studying happens to have been studied before and there's an instrument capturing that, you're better off using that. Um, okay, this is a laundry list. Uh, I'm not gonna go over this. Laundry list of things to keep in mind as you're forming questions, feel free to refer to this uh, later. And, and these are all from the book. Okay, so here's, here's another cool example. We're talking about open-ended questions and we're, we're studying here whether it matters how you're wording things. Like, do you get different answers depending on how you word your question? Um, and we had, this is a direct continuation of the sitting down for, for meals as a family example from a few seconds ago. So here are three versions of the same question with, with different phrasing. The first one, when did you begin your studies at Washington State University? Okay. Um, so this one, if when the researchers asked the question this way, they had um, about 13% of respondents filling in the month and year when they started their studies. Um, and about 57% reporting the, the semester, the season and semester, like you know, fall 2020 or something. Okay. Here's how much how different these. Uh, numbers are when you slightly change the way you're wording the question. So the second version is, what date did you begin your studies at Washington State University? So here you're specifically asking for a date. Okay, it's so not when. When is more ambiguous than date. Date is sort of specific kind of when. So when you're asking what date, you get from 13% of respondents mentioning month and year, you get about 50% mentioning month and year. Okay. And, and one more still, if you can ask specifically about that, if you're interested in capturing month and year for whatever reason, right? You can ask specifically about that. Because what month and year did you begin your studies at Washington State University? 84% of respondents gave you that. Um, and so there's much less ambiguity in uh, if that was a target, if you were looking to collect that kind of data, you know, at that granularity or in that format, then look how much um, the, the way you're wording the question, how much that impacts the, the quality of the data that you're collecting. Um, here's another one. 
the same question again. The question is, how would you describe your PhD advisor? Okay. In your own words, how would you describe your PhD advisor? You know, annoying or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and the two formulations are th this one, the original, and the one with a prefix that uh, tells you that, that reinforces how important this question is. Okay, so this question is very important to understanding the Washington State University student experience. Please take your time answering it. Okay, so just this prefix. Okay? I haven't changed any of the wording, but I um, added this prefix to um, provide additional motivation for people to respond to this. Okay, I guess which one is likely to elicit more responses. I would guess the second one, but I still think this sentence is a little bit vague for me. Just to say it's important to understand without knowing like what's the specific purpose of this survey or what would you use this survey for? Hmm. Still a little bit vague. Right, so good, good, good point. What I imagine happened here is in the original communication, so remember this was um, this was the survey that we discussed last time we met with the different ways they contacted people and, and recruited them to participate uh, with the $2 in the mail uh, thing okay, from Tuesday. Remember that? That's, we're talking about the same study here. So in there, if you recall, they had a lot of information in the invitation letter and in the follow-up emails about what the goals of the study were and uh, who the researchers were and why they were doing this and so on. So this extra prefix motivation here is in addition to all of those things which they will have already communicated. That makes sense? So it's just a reminder, it's just a reminder. It's as simple as this. It's a reminder that, you know, hey, this, this part is important, right? So, you know, if, if I'm in doubt whether to, you know, skip this question or not, if they're telling me they really care about answering about me answering this particular question, you know, let me let me yeah let me do that right. Um, by the way, this is probably the same um, mechanism that explains why the two dollar incentive worked as the social exchange mechanism. Okay, so like you know here um, the by telling you that this is extra important right you're you're more likely to um to want to participate right Be because you sort of perceive the additional importance of of you answering this question um okay this here's another good good thing this also applies to interviews if anything it applies more to interviews than to surveys so um the question here was this interviewer survey question was what businesses would you most like to see in the Washington area, uh, the Seattle area, I guess is where this is, um, that are currently not available? Okay, this was the survey question. So the study that, that I'm citing um, randomly split students into two groups. Um, in, in one group, there was no additional follow-up probe to this question. In the other group, they asked, in addition to this question, they asked after people responded, are there any others? Okay, so these are the conditions. Everybody got the same question, but one group got the additional probe, are there any others? Okay, guess what happened? Uh, people answered yes or no, <laughs> rather than giving examples. Oh, uh, they, that's a good point too. They, no, they actually gave examples. So in the no probe condition, an average of 1.8 businesses were mentioned and the probe condition, an average of 2.4. Okay, so this way you, the researchers have uh, collected a lot more data, right? With just this one very simple thing, but probing people, you know, are, can you tell me more? Are there any others? Even though combining the two answers would result in a valid answer to the first question. 
So yes. yeah, that's that's interesting. Yes, but but just because so right, so people could have already mentioned all of this from the beginning, right? Uh, as as an answer to the original question, but when probed to provide more information, they um, they produced more. They had more information. Right? So th this speaks to how important probing is in an interview, right? If you just stick or or a sur survey, I guess, but um, especially in an interview, if you stick to just the original questions and you kind of go on to the next one after they've answered and you sort of never follow up, you're likely going to get much less richer information out of this and and, and data out of this. I. Actually, wonder if it's a good practice to do this follow-up question. So first of all, I, I don't think I will be very pleasant if I receive this kind of surveys uh, because I, I would prefer that if we can finish it in one time, I prefer not to do it separately. Mm -hmm. And also practically that it may exert actual selection bias or non-response bias because the, the respondent you receive from the second round may be different. Uh, because it's only a small portion of the response you received in the first round. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so what I'm interpreting you to ask is um, how often, if at all, should you do this? And I would say um, use this sparingly. Use this uh, for questions that are maybe extra important, like the one from, from before, you know, questions that are very important. Use it sparingly for those, and maybe don't use it all the time with every question you're asking, because I think you're right, Bobo. It, it could be really annoying, right? I will I'll be angry by the end of the interview, or, or more angry than I was going to be anyway, um, if you keep probing me in this way, right? So you know, interviewing is as much of an art as it is a science. If anything, it's probably more of an art than than it is a science. Like the psychology uh, research. It's the science, but um, you know it's a lot more of an art, right? Or it's at, at least at least as much of an art. So you know, use your your best judgment, right? And feel feel the room, the conversation, and you know, use this sparingly whenever whenever you really feel like you you need to, and you know, don't be annoying as an interviewer. To Jeremy's point from earlier, like, does it matter how you phrase the probe? Yes. Okay, that too. Everything matters. Okay, this, we're so um, as humans, we're so um, sensitive to the, all of these, all of these things, uh, subject to all of these biases, if you will. So here, um, the, back to the earlier question. In your own words, how would you describe your uh, advisor or advisors? Um, they had two uh, versions of the probe. Okay. One version was, is there anything else? So this, this Jeremy, you, I think you intuited correctly uh, a minute ago that people could just say no. Right, yeah. Because That's not the, what yeah. Right, and your intent is not to collect yes, no answers, but to collect more examples, more instances, right? Mm -hmm. So because of the, the formulation of the probe, there's a risk that people might just say no. Um, so that, that happens, look at, look. So um, when probed this way, only 18% of respondents provided additional information and most people said no. Whereas when probed um, with, can you tell me more about that? Or you know, would you tell me, or please tell me more about that. That would be even better. Um, Cause you know, maybe can you tell me more about that? It's still no, I cannot tell you more about that. Uh, side note, if I ask you, can you tell me more about that? Why aren't you likely to say no? I, I'm claiming you're not likely to say no to, to can you tell me more about that? Why? There's, um, there's inherently more obviously more information that is being requested than like are you capable of doing this thing it's not it's it would be dumb to ask an are you capable question rather than a what do you know question but still i mean the question could be interpreted as an are you capable question 
but why aren't you going to do that? Why is that unlikely? We because talked about it earlier and we talked about it on Tuesday. What's the, the mechanism or the bias? Social desirability. I don't want to be rude uh, for the people who interview me. Yes, acquiescence is the better one, I think. Okay. That you're um, more likely to be agreeable. Okay. So if you say no, like if I ask you, can you tell me more about that? It's obviously formulated as an invitation for you to tell me more. Um, and if you were to say no, I cannot tell you more, that would be disagreeable. Okay, so people do not like to be disagreeable. So people are more likely to actually respond because of acquiescence. They, they want to be agreeable. Okay, so you can see here, huge difference. 82% of people gave more information when probed this way compared to only 18% in the, in the first version. Okay, so amazing, right? Look how much of a difference something so small can make. This seems so insignificant and, and minute uh, on the surface. So, um, sorry. Um, so, Bogdan, for, yes. so for the is question, why isn't that acquiescence? It, it is. Um, I think. I think they both are, but I think okay. the the can you tell me more is more a more direct invitation to provide more information. I, I see. think it's, it's just more intrusive. Maybe that's a way to describe it. More okay. inviting. Thank you. I, I would say they both are. I think acquiescence would play out with both of them. I just feel like the second one is more, more inviting. I see. All right, so look, more acquiescence. Do you favor congressional term limits of four years? But answer options, favor or oppose. What's wrong with this? It asked me, do you favor? Which means I would assume the author favors. So, right, so it, it incorporates your your bias as as interviewer or researcher right because it's not a neutral uh formulation and so leading you right in this direction of favoring and because of acquiescence you're more likely to agree than to disagree so you're more likely to also favor right to, to select favor this way how would you reformulate this Maybe a little bit more open-ended, like how many years do you think congressional members should serve in, in Congress? Mm -hmm. But what, what if you want to ask specifically about the four-year term? Is there a way to make this more neutral? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, just rephrase it to a should question. Should congressional terms be limited to four years? And yes, no. Mm -hmm. The... Uh... I, I'll have an example in a second. So let, let's look at, uh, I'll have a, a version of it. I don't remember what the one I have pulled from the book is. Um, let's look at the second example for, for a second. How satisfied are you with the overall service you have received from X? Okay. Very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, very, very dissatisfied. Same problem, okay? So here you're not allowing the, option of dissatisfaction in the question. The question only asks, only assumes that you're satisfied to varying degrees, but you cannot be dissatisfied, right? As per the question. You are given the option in the answers, but you're, it's not part of the question. So here are some ways to reformulate this that the, the book uh, proposed. Um, I, I think I think the first one is sort of what you had, Jeremy, right? Do you favor or oppose, I guess, do you favor or oppose, right? So yeah. The bipolar formulation here, um, right? So your both options are therefore allowed because you're asking explicitly about uh, both of them. And the same for the other one. Do, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you? Okay. So now you could ask, we talked about, you know, anchoring and priming and so on. You could ask, like, does the order matter? You know, like, 
should you ask do you favor or oppose or should you ask do you oppose or favor you know i i don't know i don't i don't have any data on that yeah. it, it may or may not right? but if i've learned anything by reading this uh, chapters from the book is that virtually everything matters so you know i don't know i wouldn't be surprised if that's the case too is there any reason to since like we're uncertain whether the order matters um is there any reason why these are often worded like a, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you rather than just like how do you feel about where it's entirely neutral and um and, and still like what, be give, do you mean still be given the answers favor and oppose or, or something or or uh, yeah like specifically with the second one you see like how satisfied or dissatisfied are you um quite a lot Mm -hmm. And it seems like it could be reworded to just say, like, how do you feel about the overall service? And then there's still the ordering of the questions, but you're at least removing the ordering of how you're introducing them in the question. Mm. That, that makes sense to me. I, I appreciate the comment. I, I don't know. Uh, that seems plausible to me that, that you could do that. But I, I don't have any data to show you about that specifically. I, it seems like a good idea to me. Does anybody know specifically about the, this, like removing the um, adjective, the answer options from the question itself? I, the only thing I can think of is that by doing that, you're effectively making the question more ambiguous or, or less precise which is one of these things to generally avoid. I right? said, so that's the only thing I can think of, but I mean, you're still providing all the answer options. So, you know, it, it seems plausible to me. I don't know. I, I, think, I think it could work, but I, I don't have any empirical data to support that. So another thing that makes a huge difference, by the way, um, is the order in which the, answer, the answers are given. Okay, so this has to do with primacy or anchoring, I think it's sort of sort of the same thing uh, as I understand it. So here um, they're asking which of the following resources that the students use at the university and uh, people were asked to check all that apply. Okay, on the left hand side, you see that the list of answer options starts with libraries and library instruction is uh, buried towards the bottom. On the right hand side, the order has been flipped. Okay, so I haven't, I haven't changed anything but completely uh, anything other than flipping completely the, the order. Okay, so now libraries is at the bottom and library instruction is, is second from the top. So here, the interesting bit is that um, a lot more people select library instruction when presented with that option earlier than they do when presented with that option later. Okay, um, because um, you know, in, in the left hand side example, by the time they get to consider library instruction they will have already selected libraries in general, and they probably think that instruction is sort of subsumed by libraries and they don't click it as much. Okay. And the example on the right-hand side, they haven't seen libraries yet. So they, they, you know, they see the specific uh, part of libraries or, or service the library offers, which is instruction, before they've been primed, before they get a chance to be, uh, to consider libraries as a whole. Right, because uh, people tend to read these linearly, and you know they don't tend to read the entire set of answer options, and so they consider them as a whole and whatnot, and kind of uh, fill in their answers after considering everything. It's people just read linearly. So the order in which you list your uh, your answer options has a huge impact on so the data you're collecting. By the way, also go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, is the lesson here that you should carefully select a fixed order or sh you should 
randomize the order because I could see both ad addressing this problem. I, the, the practice that I see commonly is randomizing the order. But um, for things like um, the level of agreement with some statement or disagreement, you can't really randomize those. It'd be very confusing. Right. right? Yeah. So, it, it also seems like in this specific example, you would sort of always want library instruction to come before libraries because of this specific effect where someone might consider library instruction to have already been covered by libraries. Right. I agree. So, yeah. So yeah, randomization might, you know, half of the time this doesn't happen, for example. Mm -hmm. I guess the lesson is you should think about this ahead of time. And it sort of depends on what right. research questions are and what you're looking to get out of this. But the point is it matters how you list them, the order in which you list them. So you should be deliberate about doing about how you decide to do that. That's I guess the meta point. Got it. Um, and I, I agree, you know, I, I don't know that as a general best practice, although randomized is often what people do when, when that's possible. Here's another gotcha. So here um, you're asking people to select uh, all that apply. Um, which of the following items, gadgets do you own? Okay, desktops, laptops, cell phones, e-readers, tablets, iPods, what have you. Okay, um, what's the risk you think with this formulation? I have things that do a few of these at once is one thing. Hmm. But, My cell phone is several of these. But in, so let me rephrase. Um, how certain are you that, um, especially as this list can be quite long, how certain are you that if I don't select e-reader, that means I actually do not have an e-reader versus that I just missed the answer option because there were too many. Do you see that? And, and I mean, also like, you know, I have a long list of things to check. I check a few and I, you know, I call it the day, right? It's good enough for government work as they say or something, right? You know. Whatever, like, you know, even if I have all of them, that means more clicks for me. So, like, you know, I, I gave them a few answers. I have these things, you know, it doesn't, like, you know, maybe, maybe I don't need to go through all of them because that would take me longer to fill it, fill out the survey. And that's just annoying. Right? I want to be done with this as quickly as I can, right? As a participant. So, a better way um, to um, rephrase, to, to reorganize the same question is to ask individually about every item. Okay, so here people have to make this deliberate decision, right, for every, um, for every option, right? So they have to select, you know, yes or no for e-readers uh, if you implement it that way, okay? And this sort of reduces the risk that um, uh, people just miss answer options, right? Not that they don't have those devices, but they just sort of skip over those answer options. So you don't have any information about whether they have them or not. Um, this way, especially if you enforce the, you know, the, that all of these be answered, um, you at least get information about all of them. Okay. So in terms of um, in terms of efforts to fill this uh, in. This is a little bit more costly, right? For the participants, the second one. And the first one, I only click on an item if I have it. And the second one, I have to click on every item, right? So it's more clicks for me as a, as a participant and therefore it will take me longer. So, you know, it's a balance, right? You have to like, think about this. Like, you know, how many, how long is your survey? How many questions do you have? You know, how, how much do you care that these be more accurate versus less accurate and so on, right? But 
Um, if you can afford it, the, the book recommends the second design over the first one. Um, okay, so this was about so general style questions. Um, I want to dive a little bit deeper into Likert style questions. Um, I just learned this uh, the other day as I was uh, preparing these slides that it's pronounced Likert, not Likert. Like no, the... no, that, that can't be right. <laughs> really? I've never heard anyone say this. Yeah, so the Wikipedia page starts by saying commonly mispronounced Likert. Oh no, I have to tell a few scientists friends. <laughs> I know. I, I was I was shocked as well. Um, I believe Hala, you knew this already, and you know never shared this with us. Did I? I, I feel like you've mentioned you've pronounced it correctly in the past. I maybe I have, but I don't know. But maybe just for me, it, it looked like liquor. But mm. yeah. <laughs> I, um, I anyway. I was, I was shocked to learn this, but not, but now I, I I did, and and so did you. So um, this is maybe. Maybe the most common, you see these everywhere, right? The most common style of survey question, okay? So um, a few misconceptions. I, I learned other things too. Um, turns out Wikipedia is an amazing resource, who knew? So um, turns out that what we call a Likert scale in general is not correct. That's uh, not what we should call a Likert. Typically we call a Likert scale this, horizontal axis with answer options, right? At least that's sort of the common misconception I had before. I, I used to call that horizontal scale with the answer options a Likert scale. That is not correct. Um, that, is a, that is an item. The scale is the set of all of these questions and answer options together that try to capture some same construct. Okay, so the scale is not an individual set of answers for one item. The scale is the whole set of uh, answers, I guess. Okay, so who knew? Anyway, so apparently this was the other thing that apparently everybody uh, gets wrong everywhere, and like the literature and so on when they talk about this. So the, the correct terminology, I, I, as I understand, is, is that the scale is the whole thing and the, that's an item. Um, okay, so wh what's the trick with these? The trick is that you give people um, these um, you know, qualitative, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, answer options, you know, strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree, uh, but secretly in the back end, you uh, encode these as um, numeric values, uh, typically ranging from, from you know, one to five. So it's, you know, starting at one and going all the way up to whatever, however many answer options you have, right? So you know, strongly, um, actually here, because they're reverse coded, um, I start from strongly agree and I end with strongly disagree. I, the, the numbering scheme is also reversed. But let's say you know, starting from one uh, corresponding to strongly disagree and going all the way up to five corresponding to strongly agree. Uh, and by doing this, by, by secretly coding and coding these as, as numbers in the back end, you can do all kinds of statistical analyses of the, um, the data you're collecting this way from the survey. So that's, uh, that's what people do uh, with these. Okay? So the, the, this was um, developed, well, not this uh, example from Wikipedia, but this style of questioning was developed by Likert in 1920, if I remember correctly, as part of his PhD thesis. Uh, and so it's been around for a hundred years. All right. Um, so now, what are the typical concerns with something like this? So we talked about measurement error um, before. So that comes back here uh, again. So um, there's so two two big concerns with any kind of measurement, including these measurements. Um, one is reliability. So reliability is about um, whether you can reliably find whatever it is you're looking for, whatever you're trying to, to measure. So that means uh, so two things. So for, if we're talking about consistency, right? then remember the scale is the set of items, right? They're all trying to capture the same construct. So 
the scale can be consistent or inconsistent. It's consistent, and that's a good thing, if um, the all of the individual items on the scale so all capture all point to this construct that you're secretly trying to capture okay and it, it's inconsistent if different individual items in the scale um point to to different things so um one way to to measure this right you want to do this more precisely is, is with something called Cronbach's alpha, some one measure of, of correlation or, or consistency. The idea here is very simple. So let's say you have, let me go back. Let's say we have these, um, these items on the scale, these five items on the scale that are all capturing uh, satisfaction with the Wikipedia website. Okay. Um, I could um, split this in two, right? I could take the first two items and the last three items, for example, okay? And if the scale is consistent, the so overall satisfaction value I compute from these first two items, for example, the sum of these uh, numbers for each individual item, that should be very highly correlated with the overall satisfaction value I compute from the last three items. Does that make sense? That means it's consistent. It means the different items sort of point towards the same construct. So Cronbach's alpha measure, it looks at all possible splits and computes this average correlation between, between all of those. Okay, so the higher, the better. That means, you know, it doesn't matter how you um, split your, your scale up into, uh, into groups. They all uh, point, if on average they have, they're very highly correlated, that means the scale is consistent. That's a good thing. You, that's something you want in a scale. Um, so that, that was, we talked about the sort of uh, split half correlations and the average of all possible split half correlations. That was the alpha measure. Um, you could compute that automatically with any, you know, your favorite statistics uh, software or Python or what have you. Um, and the other kind of uh, reliability here is stability over time, right? So like if, for example, if the survey um, uh, tries to capture these attributes that uh, are known to be stable over time, like uh, personality or, or over long periods of time, attitude towards, I don't know, climate change or things like that. But if, if you were to survey uh, people at, you know, six months apart, right? about one of these attributes that is known to be stable, but you'd better get uh, you know, similar answers, right? The, the second time compared to the first time. So that has to do with stability. That's another measure of reliability or, or way to think about reliability. Um, you don't often have the luxury of doing this, right? You don't often redo a study or a survey you know, later just to see if things are um, stable this way. So that doesn't happen as much in practice. But the first one about consistency between uh, scale items, that's very, very common. You, you'll see that a lot. Um, okay, so that was uh, reliability. Validity is about whether the measurements are actually, uh, or, or rather, um, is whatever you're measuring, that does whatever you're measuring actually correspond to the thing you think you're measuring. That's about validity. So I think I gave you an example last time um, where the thing I thought uh, I was measuring was um, wealth and the measure I was using was uh, last year's income. I remember that we talked about it on Tuesday and we talked about how um, that's not entirely valid or not highly valid because of, for example, people that retired who do not have yearly income anymore, but maybe have lots of wealth or do not have high yearly income anymore, as high yearly income anymore, but have lots of wealth. So um, here, um, right, so the, the, the same idea here, right? So how well does whatever you're measuring actually correspond to whatever you think you're measuring? Uh, and I'll show you a concrete example of how you might um, decide this. Um, but, but first, 
a few more like gotcha things. Should you have a midpoint? Why or why not? I mean, non-committal answers are valid sometimes. There are, there are times when you don't agree or disagree with something. And in those cases, you're forcing someone to make a choice between agreement and disagreement when they might not actually feel that way. Cool. So that's, that's an argument in favor of keeping it. Can anybody argue in favor of removing it? Um, I, yeah, um, wait, uh, yes, um, because, um, I think people, so making a decision is hard. It introduces like cognitive stress. And I think people are inclined to have a bias toward selecting leader if, if it's presented mm -hmm. the yeah. law of the least effort, I guess. Plus social desirability. Uh, would be the other thing that I, comes to mind uh, here. Um, like, maybe I don't want to tell you that I, I really like massively multiplayer online role playing games because I don't know, you'll think I'm a nerd or something, right? So may, maybe I don't want to admit to that. So, or, um, you know, maybe I really hate them and I sort of know that you like them and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to admit that I hate them because you know i don't want to offend you so this the safe option is to just um um pick the middle ground but what if i don't actually have an opinion right so the the subtlety here is between you know, actually having a neutral opinion about the topic versus not having an opinion at all. So the risk, the risk with keeping it is that you can't really distinguish between those. If I don't have an opinion at all, then you know, I'm, I'm likely to select neither because I, you know, I haven't really thought about it, but it's not that I am ambivalent about it. It's just that I haven't really formed an opinion about it. Those could be very, very different. I, I, I realize it's subtle, but um, I think you get the idea. They could be very different. So this, this seems like a non-ordinal answer, though. Oh, that's on the slide here. Yeah. <laughs> the the point was there should be like a no answer option, essentially. Um, so you don't factor those into your analysis of the you know numerical value that you assign to these. Correct. Yeah. So that that's one of the proposed. Um, ways to phrase questions like these to try to separate those two scenarios right actually having an ambivalent opinion versus uh, having no opinion at all i think all that it may depend on the the people you interview for example if you are interviewing about people's ideas on uh, policy whether they agree or disagree and if you are interviewing some policy analytics or policy experts, they should have known this policy where. So that removing this neither or mutual option will encourage them to, to actually express their opinions. But if the people you are interviewing is the general public or the city, normal citizen, it's very likely that they have never heard of this policy before. So it's necessary to keep a neutral option there. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I guess I'm telling I'm going to tell you the same thing I told Jeremy earlier, and that is, you're right. It's context dependent. The, the meta point is you have to be deliberate about this, though, given your study context, your research questions, your your sample, and so on. Right? You have to be deliberate about how you phrase these questions to reduce as many of these these biases as you can, or reduce them as much as you can. Right, but the point is about being deliberate more so than there being a, an always one size fits all best uh, way of doing things. Um, oh yeah, so yeah, we, we talked about this. This is more of the same. It's one, one famous example of this. 
when you give the four point option without a midpoint versus the five point option, you see um, scores higher for the five point item than, than you see for the four point um, item. But as far as I could tell, there's some disagreement in the literature here. So there's some follow-up studies to the original one that haven't been able to replicate that. So, you know, I'm not sure. Take this with a grain of salt. Um, much of social psychology has been in question lately. So, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, and we talked about that as well. Okay, so um, to summarize this, right, okay. So um, good news is, these items tend to be pretty robust. So the, the literature is um, split sometimes, but overall they tend to be pretty robust to, to variations. Um, midpoint versus not being one of them. So, you know, it, it may matter, but, but maybe not super much. Um, you can ask how many options should you give? Um, five versus seven versus three, you know, those, that's a common decision you make. Um, and um, it also doesn't seem to matter all that much. Uh, what I see commonly is, is sort of five being recommended um, over, over three and, and even seven. Another decision is whether you label all the points versus whether you only label the endpoints. So do you see that, uh, what that would mean over there? Um, The one where you only label the endpoints is the one where you have strongly disagree on one end, strongly agree on the other end, and just just the values in between without uh, labeling the the midpoints, uh, and that doesn't seem to matter much either. So um, I guess overall, overall, it doesn't really matter uh, all that much. Is what I would summarize this as. Um, okay, so now we we're running short on time. I want to leave you with. An example, um, which you probably will have to read about on your own because I don't want to keep you uh, too much over now. So this is an example of a uh, twenty-item scale that tries to capture seventh graders' pleasure in writing uh, from a study in the Netherlands. Um, so you can see uh, things like um, so essentially the same question being phrased both positively, phrased both positively and negatively. Um, you could see, um, you know, more instances of this. Um, you know, writing is boring versus writing is my favorite subject. So uh, you can see how they have, essentially, uh, this is a brain dump, if you will, of all the ways in which you could ask about how much uh, seventh graders enjoy writing. And they've created this 20 item scale, right? That collectively is, is meant to capture this concept of the construct of, of pleasure in writing, as opposed to each individual item on the scale being able to capture that by itself. So the questions that um, you would have to deal with when designing something like this are the questions of reliability and validity that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and so the way you would do this, um, and I guess you, you, know, you have to read about uh, the details on your own. Um, I've posted all the readings in our Google Drive folder, by the way, so you'll hopefully find all of this there and, and let me know if not. Um, it is using something called factor analysis. So this is a technique, a, it's a statistical analysis data summarization technique to reduce the dimensionality of a, of a large data set. So in, in our case, we'd have these 20 variables corresponding to each of the 20 items on the scale. And um, ideally, you'd want to reduce this to uh, as, as few of these as possible that sort of capture this latent underlying construct of pleasure writing, right? Um, and um, you'll see sort of how specifically they're able to, to do this and this you know, specific statistical analysis steps here to conduct uh, factor analysis and decide that, um, you know, there's even examples of how to do this in R, um, decide in, in this particular case, they have found after this factor analysis step that um, there are two underlying factors. Remember there are 20 items we started from, but there are two underlying factors essentially that capture most of this, uh, this variance in, in these 20 uh, items. And um, as it 
turns out um, they correspond to sort of the set of positively phrased and negatively phrased items on the scale. So you know, one of the factors captures um, all of these positively phrased questions and the other one does capture the, the negatively phrased ones. Uh, and turns out also that this is a common occurrence when, when you have questions phrased both positively and negatively, that you end up with sort of different underlying factors capturing both. You would probably argue, if you've, if you've paid attention to the last few minutes, probably argue that, you know, doesn't this invalidate the, the scale? Like, it, the point of this was that all 20 items should capture the same construct, right? The construct is, I don't know, pleasure writing. So ideally, right, this validation step using factor analysis would show that um, there's only one major factor, like one latent factor uh, underlying all 20 of these items. Uh, and that, that's a great criticism, uh, but uh, it seems like this is a common occurrence when you have both positively and negatively phrased questions. So um, it's technically, um, still uh, one, one factor, but it's, it's, it's too technically, right? Because of the positive and negative ones, but that's okay. So like, you know, when you have these situations with positive and negative rephrased questions, that's okay if there's two factors is, is the conclusion here. But the point is you do factor analysis on these um, survey uh, scale items and you validate that they all point in the same direction. They all capture this underlying uh, concept. And if they don't, you remove some of them. You remove the ones that are not capturing that construct. That's, that's the idea. All right, so let me end here. Uh, I've already kept you too long. Sorry about that. Um, there's readings um, in the, all of these things that I list here are in the Google Drive folder. And the lecture is based off of all of these readings. And you'll find a lot more detail there as usual. So the pl plan is to do presentations on Tuesday next week.